Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast is a Christ-centered podcast. Established in 2019 and hosted weekly by Pastor Chris Busher. Addressing a host of topics such as the Great Commission, Christian discipleship, and often featuring interviews with special guests who are experts in their field. The views and events expressed on this podcast and all related materials belong solely to their author and not necessarily to the author's employer, organization, committee, or other group or individual. While all attempts are made to present accurate information, some information may become outdated over time. Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast makes every attempt to timely update any and all such information. Without further delay, here's another powerful episode of Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. Once again, my name is Dallas here in the studio from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Today we have another amazing guest, Richie Garfield. And I know we have a lot of people who are on the show who are authors, who are working with ministries and different projects. But today, Richie is working with a project called Yeshua the Movement. And this is so cool. They're making a movie about the Gospels, about the four Gospels. And I'm really excited to hear from Richie today. First off, thank you for being here. How are you? Oh, we're doing, doing great. We're doing great, brother. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Where are you calling from today, Richie? Uh, we call, I'm calling from the Bronx, New York. Okay. And today is the 4th of July. How are you going to celebrate? Oh, it's family time, man. You know, this is just the time to just go oh. by my brother's house. He has a grill up. So hopefully the weather allows us to be out there and just enjoy the day. Mm. I've been in Brazil for two years today. And so I missed a couple of those 4th of July. But man, <laughs> I miss it. I miss that. The grill. I miss the fireworks. I miss the whole excitement of it. So enjoy that for me, Richie, please. Oh, oh definitely. Definitely. I'll keep you in mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so, Richie, before we get started into the movie itself, can you share a little bit about yourself? Can you take the next five to ten minutes and just tell us about your Christian testimony? Sure, definitely. Well, it, it really started with, you know, me and my buddy, Frank Sanderson, who's not on the call. But we both experienced a supernatural event on December 13th of 1999, where, you know, just coming out of high school, we had this experience where we felt connected to the creator of the universe. He didn't have a name. We didn't know who he was. We just knew that there was something bigger than us. And it was from that experience, you know, we would like have these insights about, you know, reality and life where we would just see things like we would see God in math. We would see God in science. We would see God in everything. But, you know, eventually like, you know, from that experience, you know, we eventually got back into the world, the things of the world, things of the flesh. So even though that experience happened, it was always in our memory. I started to just kind of like die and fade, in the fade away. So I remember my uh, a family member who lives in Florida, he invited me to a church conference that was taking place in Virginia. So he sent a letter to my house. I remember getting the letter, opening it, looking at it, and I immediately I threw it right away in the garbage. Mm-hmm. So I remember this, you know, one day I was sitting in my room and, you know, I just go through things in life, you know, you have to get into all the details of that because we all go through our things. And I was just sitting mm-hmm. there and I was like, you know, asking God, you know, like, what was that experience for? Like, what was the purpose of, you know, that whole December 13th experience? And I was sitting there and I'm looking in the garbage and I seen the letter just sticking up out the garbage. So I was like, oh, well, I might as well go, you know, what, what, what was there to lose? Mm-hmm. So I ended up going down there. You know, Virginia from New York. We uh, drove down there. I remember my, this is probably my first experience uh, with Christians outside of the Catholic experience because, you know, I grew up going to Catholic school. My father sent me there because he didn't want us to go to uh, public school. And I remember, like, as soon as I got to the conference, it was like just the friendliness that everybody was kind of weird to me. I was like, wow, i never seen so many people so friendly. But what mm-hmm. threw me off, though, is what they said about Jesus. It was like, you know, Jesus is God. And that was weird to me because to me, Jesus was just like a, a man or a man mm-hmm. that knew yeah. the, uh, our way to God. So that was the biggest uh, turn off for me. And I remember this, it was like a three day conference and the whole three days I was fighting against them. Like, oh no, man, you cannot convince me, cannot convince me. So I remember the last day of the, con- of the conference, 
it was in, we was in church, and it was it was, it was during a worship uh, a worship uh, ceremony, and I'm just looking at everybody like, wow, these people are really into this, you know, this this Jesus uh, figure. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing them worshiping, their eyes are closed, and I'm looking at everybody. And I'm like, so I basically connected to my experience I had in December 13th. I was like, okay, God. Like, what is this? Is this something that you want me to like do is something that, you know, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand how these people brainwashed. Hmm. And I remember in that moment, I like looked up and it was as if like the ceiling just kind of like spread open. I did, like it didn't spread open obviously, but that's why yeah. I felt like there was something like big above me that's happening. And immediately I got pushed upon my knees and there was like a voice that says, you know, worship me. And I remember that I'm just on the floor kneeling there. I'm like, wow, this just really happened to me. Like, mm. you know, something just pushed me on my knees. So I remember like, you know, they were closing up the doors and everything. And, you know, they were really into baptism, you know, this, this church. And I remember they were locking up the doors and I came to the pastor. I was like, you know, is it time for a baptism? And he was like, man, there's always time for a baptism. Because they opened back up the doors and I got baptized right then and there. Wow. And how old were you again? I was probably at that time of 1920. Okay. At the time, yeah, that was two thousand. It was in the year two thousand. Yeah, it was like in the June of two thousand. So I remember, like, you know, driving back up with a couple that was from New York as well, and I was sitting in the car, you know, after I got baptized, and I'm looking out the window, and all of a sudden I got convicted of my sins. Like, wow, I gotta stop really doing this. Mm-hmm. And it was from then on, man. My love for Christ has been, you know, growing and growing and growing. And, you know, just to keep my testimony relevant to what we're doing today, like, you know, I remember back in 2019, I mean, 20, 20, 2009, about three years after I got married, I walked away from the faith. Mm. I remember what happened was that there were like two Christian leaders that I looked up to that they got caught into some scandals. And, you know, I, I would say this, like, you know, a lot of times we have a lot of leaders out here, they get caught up in stuff and a lot of people walk away. Mm-hmm. What I learned from that experience is that, you know, our faith should be in Christ alone, you know, regardless of what our leaders or the people who we look up to do. But my reason for walking away wasn't just the leaders. I was also struggling with sin at that time, too. So that was just like, you know, just away from like, oh, man, if these guys are doing it and, you know, they're yeah. making money in God, I might as well just, you know, go do me. Mm-hmm. Isn't it crazy how we, we kind of use times like that as excuses? Like, oh, well, if yeah. they're doing it, I'm going to go, you know? But it's like, no, you have sin in your life too, man. What are you doing? I've had that moment in my <laughs> life as well, so I definitely get it. You're listening to the Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. We'll be right back after this quick word from our sponsors. Fallen scales a seven-day journey into seeing yourself and others through the eyes of God's heart. Jesus said to his disciples, follow me. He did not say, deal with your sin and then follow me. Through Dale R. Witherington's newest release book, Fallen Scales, we have the opportunity to follow Jesus a little closer over the next seven days and allow him to open your eyes to his incredible power of redemption. Find your copy of Fallen Scales by Dale R. Witherington on Amazon today. We are living in a time and a culture in which prayer is common yet possibly misdirected and misunderstood. On the very heart of Jesus, while teaching the disciples to pray, he addressed the approach to God and the manner in which we should pray. This book will counter the culture of our present outlook to prayer. It will promote a deeper fellowship and strengthen your relationship with God and man. Look for the book, In This Manner, Gleanings from the Lord's Prayer, Kirshen Reagan and Ricardo Surabramani. I've had that moment in my <laughs> life as well, so I uh, definitely get it. The thing about mm-hmm. it, what I realized with me, I was like, I think like every Christian kind of backslides. But the thing with me is that I never grew up in a church. So me going back to myself was going back to me before church. Mm-hmm. So I just ended up, you know, I didn't really have nothing against God or nothing like that. It was just that, you know, I just wanted to do me. So I've been away from God for about like seven years or so. And it wasn't until 2016 where I started to get my convictions again. But I was in bondage to a sinful situation. And I was mad. I was wanted a way out, wanted a way out. I remember that it was one day, it was one morning, I was one on my knees and I just surrendered to God. 
and his Holy Spirit just came back and accepted me back to his family. You know, tears are pouring from my eyes. I'm like, God, how can you accept me back after I walked away from you? Mm-hmm. And I remember prior to that, too, I started to have like a something against Christians and to a point where I probably felt that I could have became an atheist, you know? And I remember when I was praying in that moment, the Holy Spirit, like, you know, the words that came to me was like, sin no more or something worse will happen to you. And I will say this, since 2006, 2016, I never went back to porn ever again. And it was like, you know, some people say, okay, you know, your addiction to porn or whatever is like a process. It was the power of God, the forgiveness of sin that gives us the power to overcome sin. There was nothing in myself that allowed me to overcome that. And, you know, and I took his word seriously too, man. Mm-hmm. I was like, I never wanted to lose that connection with God again. So I knew that, like, you know, the sexual sin in my life was a thing that kept me away from God. And, you know, say five years later now, here I am, you know, here making mm-hmm. a movie about Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's, thank you for bringing it all together back with that. And thank you for sharing your story with our listeners today. I know that there's people out there who can relate to that story and who have experienced similar hurts from church leaders who have had experience Mm -hmm. other things in their life that they need to cut out to get closer to God. So thank you for sharing that. No problem, brother. And so can you just tell our listeners this Yeshua movement, what is it? Yeshua, the movement. So before we talk about the movement, you got to talk about the movie that inspired the movement. Okay. So I remember back in, like you said, you know, go back to me and my, my buddy Frank, you know, one of the movies that influenced us back in 1999 was The Matrix. And, you know, we was like, man, this is like a movie that's like kind of talking about, like, you know, God, you know, the basically we're in a world where we're born into and then the reality, reality of God comes to us and like we open to a whole new reality. And we always wanted to see like uh even after i got after i got baptized and everything and we got you know more into like the christian side of the faith we always wanted to see jesus represented in a way hollywood represents other characters um one of the biggest movies that influenced me was in 2004 uh it's called the gospel of john it was directed by philip seville who you know passed in 2016 What this movie did was that it took the Gospel of John and it took it word for word. So basically, when you're seeing Jesus speak in this movie, he's speaking the words from his Gospels. And I remember at that time, too, around 2004, like I was kind of like away from God, too, in a sense. Man, this movie brought me back to God so close, like because seeing Jesus speak, there were parts where I was like, okay, you know, it's out of that. Jesus is crazy, or he is who he say he is. And if you go the latter route, you know, you get the power of God. So just like, you know, just to see him speak his words, and it, it was able to like, you know, bring me back to, you know, closer to him. I'm like, man, if people were able to see this themselves in a way that's relatable, you know, imagine the power that will come upon them. So that was, you know, fast forward back to now to, to uh, 2016, 17. Me and my buddy started to bring up the idea again, like, you know, what if, like, you, we were able to make a CGI movie, you know, of, you know, taking all four Gospels to combine them into one narrative and just make a, you know, movie trilogy from that. So that's where the idea came from to, you know, make the movie. But to execute it was a different thing. You know, we weren't directors. We weren't filmmakers. You know, by profession, I'm an engineer. My buddy, he's a real, he was into real estate and, and to other business um, ventures, entrepreneurship. So, you know, we was like, okay, what if we did it like how they made the King James Bible, where they had a committee of about uh, 47 scholars come together and, he, you know, they, you know, brought together this awesome translation of the Bible. So we was like, let's go that route, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, that, that that was not reality because people are so busy these days. So I remember, like, Frank had a friend that we was talking to the whole concept of the project, and he was like, you know, why don't you guys just do it? So I said, you know, why not? So the first thing I did was I, I got a study Bible, a John MacArthur study Bible. And in there, it has, like, the harmony of the Gospels, where it has all the scriptures lined up in the order that, mm-hmm. you know, he, I think, he sees fit, how, you know, how they progress it through the Gospels. 
I end up just basically going to BibleGateway.com, looking at the scriptures, and just copy and pasting, copy and pasting, copy and pasting, which was like a six month process. Mm-hmm. After we did, after I did that, I just read the combined gospels, and man, that was like that experience right there was probably the best experience of my relationship with God to see the combined gospels play out in front of me. And as I'm reading through the combined gospels, I'm seeing these themes play out. So I was like, man, now we got to basically find someone that, that could do script writing. Mm-hmm. So we ended up like contacting John Goldsmith, who did the screenplay for Gospel of John. So we ended up contacting him, talking about the project, but we didn't have a script. So when it, his agent asked us if we had a script, we said, you know, we had nothing available. So he said, you know, he's not interested. We ended up contacting John McArthur Ministries to see if, you know, if they were interested in, you know, helping us with the project. And, you know, it was like, you know, they're not interested at the moment and stuff like that. So I ended up, you know, I said, you know what, let me try writing the script together, you know, let me put, this, put together the script. So I ended up basically looking at the combined gospels. And basically what I did was just write, I just wrote what I saw play out as I'm reading it. Ended up basically making three movie scripts. And of course, wow. you know, we hired like a, a screen editor to help us with the, you know, the word in. And we got a screenplay software to basically this software called Fade In. And that right there made it you know, that was like a big help. Like it helped us to categorize the characters, the uh, you know, the uh, transition effects, all that stuff. And yeah, so we got three movie scripts. So then it was like, okay, we got three movie scripts now. Let's tell the public, hey, man, we got these three movie scripts. You want to basically write, you know, make this movie about, you know, uh, the combined gospels of Yeshua. And, you know, of course we call it Yeshua because, you know, we kind of wanted to go organic with the uh, with the language. Still in English, but kind of had the characters use their Aramaic uh, transliterations of their names to kind of be like an authentic feel to that century. Mm-hmm. So we thought, okay, well, how are we going to do this now? How are we going to convince people? And, you know, people weren't convinced, obviously, because people are busy these days. So, you know, we had some money saved up, you know, in, in, you know, in, a, in a bank account. So we thought, okay, what if we make a teaser trailer, you know, from a scene in our script? which is basically the teaser, the teaser trailer you see today. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically we went out, we was, you know, researching, you know, CGI artists out there. We ended up finding this, uh, this uh, solo artist, you know, Cloud Band Studios. And basically it took him about three to four years because, you know, it's a one man studio. And of course mm-hmm. he probably had like other people that he helped, that helped him along the way. But it took us three to four years just to get this trailer out. And wow. now we have the trailer now. So it was like, okay, we have the trailer now. How do we plan to fund it? And this is where Yeshua, the movement comes along. You know, I remember seeing this video about covetness, about like how if the world was to cut their weapon budget by 1%, we will be able to eliminate poverty across the board. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, just, you know, 1% of the weapon budget. So now when it comes to like, you know, the body of Christ, like, you know, here's another project that's going to cost millions of dollars to make. What are we doing for the poor? You know, like mm-hmm. we have all this money coming to make a movie in, and that's where God inspired us to basically to fund this movie with his body and to provide relief for his lost sheep in the process. So we came up with a way to basically say, all right, we have the subscription plan we made now, $7 per month. So we said, you know, let's, do something where we're not going to be a burden upon people. Let's say like, okay, if we, if we could get 100,000 people or 100,000 subscriptions at $7 a month, we could definitely make this movie happen. Mm-hmm. And the reason why we go on the subscription route is because that with subscriptions, you're able to forecast what you're able to do for the next month. If you know you had 100 subscribers, you know you're able to do 100 subscribers worth of work. If you have 100,000 subscribers, you, we, we know what we're able to do every month. So we said to us, all right, okay, let's level set our budget for the film. Once you find out how much it's going to cost us a month to make the film, to make the movie, that excess money that we're going to have, what are we going to do with that? Are we just going to keep it for ourselves? Said, no, we got to start basically, you know, we're not doing something. We're not reintroducing the gospel to the world. Like God, you know, Christ died mm-hmm. on the cross nearly 2,000 years ago. We should be doing the work of the cross now. So we said, okay, the excess money that's left over, we will take this money and to basically give it to nonprofits that specialize, you know, in giving to the poor, the orphans, mm-hmm. the trafficked, the persecuted, the sick, 
in a distant franchise. And also that too, like every $7 subscription that we have, like $1 is immediately going to this organization called Food for the Poor. So, you know, the movement is basically, you know, we're making this movie of the combined gospels, but we also want to do the work of the cross as well. And so, you know, we're not directly getting involved with the nonprofits. Like the nonprofits already exist out there. We're just giving them money. Yeah. Our main focus is the focus of this on making the film. Mm -hmm. Wow. I want to ask a question for you. You were saying yeah. that, so you're making this trilogy on the combined gospels and you want it to be big, biblically accurate without any contradictions. What's the biggest yeah. challenge in staying true to the scriptures throughout the film and the writing of the scripts? Yes. So, you know, God gave us four gospels, obviously. And this is the way he, he's presented, you know, his, his truth to us. So the first thing is that you want to still stay true to the gospels themselves. So I give you an example, like um, in the Gospel of John, what John one twenty nine, it says the next day. If it says the next day, that means we cannot jump to another gospel. We got to mm. stay within the Gospel of John, you know. And one of the biggest challenges too, like we you know in the Gospel of John that, you know, Jesus meets Peter before he even meets Peter in the Synoptic Gospels. Like we have him meeting Peter on the boat, but here mm. in John we have him meeting Peter like uh, by introduction from his brother Andrew. So the challenge is basically how do we um, kind of resolve that supposed contradiction? But yeah. we notice in the, in the kind of synoptic gospel, they never said that, okay, this is the first time he met Peter. So basically we came up with a creative, like, uh, you know, as you follow the trail of Christ through, you know, through the gospels, like, you know, when he went from Judea to Samaria, and then he went to Nazareth. You know, it's basically find out what happened between, you know, his interaction with Peter and then his next meeting with Peter at the boat. So that's something that, you know, audience who see in the movie, how that plays out. You know, do we say that that's what really happened? Of course, you know, there's going to be creative ways to like, you know, kind of resolve things. But what we are doing with this movie is that the dialogues of Christ, we're not touching or we're not adding nothing to what he says. So in a sense, like you see with most movies that they kind of like build Jesus around the movie, meaning that they'll break him up. And because they want to stick to their narrative of their, of their film projects, they'll put Jesus here. They will give words to him here. And look, you know, there's, you know, there's creative ways to make a Jesus movie. I'm not saying it's heresy per se, but if you want the true authentic Christ, you got to basically stick to his words. So what our movie does, instead of basically building Jesus around the movie, we're building our movie around Jesus. And the difference. I think that's amazing. All... That's the best way, it sounds like. Oh, oh man. Wow. I mean, mm -hmm. I have testimonies of why his words are so powerful. I remember back in 2004, uh, there was this uh, friend of mine that, you know, she was uh, dying of cancer. You know, she wasn't, you know, she wasn't a Christian and, and uh, uh, she wasn't a Christian or anything like that. And I remember we used to go there and visit her every day in the hospital and stuff like that. And of course, she started getting some more involved. She wanted to know more about Christ and everything. People will come there and pray for her. So I remember I was sitting there and I was asking, her, I was like, uh, have you ever received the Holy Spirit? And she was like, she didn't even know what that is. So I remember in the Gospel of John, there's this scene where he's talking about the bread of life, you know, and he's saying all these things about himself. And then a lot of people turned away from him because it was like kind of since he was talking about cannibalism in a sense, like eat my flesh, drink my blood. A lot of people walked away from him. And I remember he said, Jesus said, he was like, you know, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Or in other words, they give God's life giving spirit. So all I did was I just basically took that portion of scripture and started reading it to her. And as I'm reading it to her, I remember she grabbed my hand. She was like, Richie, I feel him. You know, three, and she, you know, she passed away three days later, man. But that experience stood with me, man, to know that the power of his words is what saves people. So we shouldn't be, we, should, we shouldn't touch them at all. We shouldn't add to them or we shouldn't take away from them. And this is what this movie is going to do, is that people are going to sit down and they're going to experience the four Gospels all at once. So, yeah. It's amazing. It sounds incredible. Yeah. So the movie title, what are you titling the movies? Oh, it's going to be called Yeshua. And, um, you know... Yeah, yeah, but part one we call Yeshua. Part two we didn't come up with a name yet. Part three is called Yeshua Messiah. Um, but the movement is just basically our 
uh, marketing, or, or you could sense our marketing way of basically, you know, we out here trying to get this funds, and this is the movement out here. You know, we're here mm-hmm. for the poor, the orphans. And, you know, I think, when I think about the orphans too, like this is our answer to like abortion. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're pro-life, but we're also pro-life also out the womb. And instead of, instead of just saying, okay, you know, don't get an abortion, what other solutions do we have for you to keep the baby? You may be a woman that's like, you know, can't afford the, you know, afford the baby or afford to raise a child. So there are organizations out here that specialize in like, you know, bringing in the orphans and all unwanted children. So we basically want to give a lot of money to these organizations as well. Amazing. And so with this, with this subscription, what other offers are involved? What other features are included in this? Do they get to keep track of who the money is going to or something like this as well? Oh, good, good, good question. Good question. So initially off the bat, you know, we're just basically offering, you know, the Yeshua movie gets made, uh, the poor gets fed because $1 goes straight to the pool for the poor and various, chari- various charities, ah, excuse me, various charities receive funds. We have, you know, we had plans to like have membership perks, but right now we just want to build our platform first before we could ever offer that. Now, when it comes to accountability now, like you say, okay, this is two guys. You know, mm-hmm. well, how can we trust that these two guys are going to do what they say with, with, with the money? So you may think, okay, $7 a month is a very low entry fee. That $7 a month plan is our way we filtered the money. Like, so basically, it's like someone gave us $7,000 at one time, right? Mm-hmm. What we do is we're dividing that by seven. That becomes to like 1,000 subscriptions. So $1,000 will go straight to food for the poor. The rest of the money, money we use for the money. I mean, we be used for the for the movie. Mm-hmm. So when we have these kind of big donors like that, right? Like, you know, you're gonna have, you know, we pray that there'll be some millionaires that will hear us and be like, hey man, I like what you guys are doing, man. You know, I'm a Christian millionaire. You know, I could give you, you guys easily three thousand dollars a month or whatever. Those will be the people that will have like inside access to our financials to make sure mm-hmm. that we are doing what we're doing with the movie, you know, with the, with the money and stuff like that, because you know. Money will change people, and we were very aware of that, covetness and all that stuff. So we definitely want to invite big donors to be our accountability partners to make sure that, you know, we're doing what we're saying. But apart from that, for the public now, one of the biggest things that we are, we are very anti-Pornea. Because we know that basically, like Paul said, you know, the body is the temple of the spirit. So we definitely cannot be out here as men, you know, men of God, like, you know, Make it a movie about Yeshua, and then still have porn addiction and stuff like that. So we said, so we have it in the operating agreement that if there's any like sexual scandals, and because you know we both married men, if anything comes up in the public setting where we're doing something that's inappropriate, we will be cut off from the Yeshua movement. So that's what we're telling the public off the bat, and we know that God will expose us. We know that God, you know, you're the you, you're our biggest accountability partner in this. So we told God, like, if anything, you see a strain, you know, cut us off, bring somebody else on that's going to be able to, you know, make this uh, movie progress. But yes, for the uh, subscribers right now, if you're like a $7 a month subscriber, basically it's like you're, you're doing this by your faith. You hear us. You love what we're doing. And um, we do plan to bring like big economy, uh, accountability partners aboard for us. Yeah. Yeah. And so I want to take the, the last few minutes here and allow our audience to get involved. And so you have this teaser, this trailer on YouTube. I saw it. Guys, it's amazing. It truly is amazing. And I'm really excited for the completion of the films as well. And so where can they find more information about this movement? Yeah, so our website, yeshuatm.net, Y-E-S-H-U-A-T-M.net. That's where you go there. You're able to find, you know, how to join, how to be a subscriber. And even if, like, you know, you're not able to financially subscribe as well, we have social media links where if we have a Facebook following, we have Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Just follow mm-hmm. us on these platforms. Share, you know, share our content. You know, we're basically making weekly content. Uh, every week we're making content weekly just to keep the interest in the movement going on. But, you know, like I said, our main goal is to get to 100,000 subscribers or, you know, I, I, I don't say 100,000 people. It could be like what it could be two people who bought 50,000 uh, subscriptions, you know, but this is something that if you're hearing us speaking, like you may go on like our Facebook and you may see like we have like about 8,000 followers on Facebook. 
and we launched back in like May and we were getting like a thousand followers every week. That doesn't mean that we have 8,000 subscribers. You know, a lot of the interest in this project is basically from people around the world, from like, especially the Philippines and Nigeria. And, you know, $7 is a lot to them for, for, uh, mm-hmm. for most people out there and stuff like that. So it's something that if you hear us speaking and you know that $7 is nothing, go right ahead and subscribe. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today, Richie. And if I can have you end our podcast today with a prayer, I would really appreciate it. Yes, definitely, definitely. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord. We know that the enemy is planning his attack against his next generation. Because he knows that once we die off, those that believe in you, as long as he has the minds of this younger generation, He will have the minds of every individual on this planet. So, Father, we pray for that. Any ministries all around the world, any movement that's rise, that you're rising up, that you will bring us all together, that you will bring us together in unity and in love for yourself and in love for each other, that we will come together and break the bonds that the enemy have on his on the minds of the younger generation, the minds of from the bondage of lust and the bondage of 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 divorce rates that's rising up even in America right now, Lord, where 50% of people are getting divorced, Father. Keep us in the mindset to war for the minds of our children and that people, when they hear this message today and they basically come together with us in prayer, that your Holy Spirit will just take over and, you know, tell, tell our hearts what we just need to do. Tell our hearts what we must need to do for the next revival, for this next generation, Father. I pray that you will break the bonds of any uh, sexual sin that, you know, men and women are under right now, that you basically give them your forgiveness, give them your love, show them your grace, show them that it's about you, it's not about us, that you have the power to break, a, break apart all the struggles that we have in families, all the struggles that we have against our neighbors, that we will stop thinking of just one mindset of just, you know, a naturalistic mindset, that we will just think about the world body right now, the world church together, whatever the denomination we are, whatever, you know, differences we have, that we will put aside to just see you glorified right now, Father, that your son, Jesus Christ, will be put upon everybody's mind, that when they even see these movies, Father, that it's not about just a good idea, that it's about your word, being presented to our hearts, Father, to break apart all the struggles, the bondage that we have, the hatred, the the fear that's in the world right now. And this is the interest that people are losing. You know, atheism is on the rise in certain countries, that we will come against you and that you will bring people, we will come against the enemy and that you will bring us together again, Father. Because that's what we need right now, Father, is unity in the body. And I pray for my brother right now that, you know, what he's doing, that he's this platform he provided for Christian creative artists to just come on his platform and to give what the Holy Spirit has laid upon our hearts. I pray for this brother right now, Father, that any plan of attack you have against him, that you will put your head around him, that he could continue to provide this, these uh, experiences and this, this, this uh, opportunities for us to just be out here and to really just to show what, you know, where God, what, what you're doing right now on the earth right now. We thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You've just listened to the Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast with your host, Pastor Chris Busher. Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast was recorded live in studio with final editing made before uploading. Subscribe today to Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast on iTunes or Google Play. For more fantastic daily content, visit Pastor Chris Busher online via Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Don't miss the next episode on Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast.